Thanks for tuning in, everyone. You're watching Arirang News. It's 2 p.m. here in Seoul, and I'm Na Hyun Gyung. The stories we are tracking for you at this hour. U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Mark Lippert, who was attacked with a knife last week, will be discharged from the hospital soon. Doctors remove all the stitches from his face. German Chancellor Angela Merkel urges Japan to confront its wartime atrocities while a German daily slams Japan for trying to whitewash history. And the much-awaited Apple Watch is finally unveiled to the world. It comes in three different models. The price will start from 350 U.S. dollars up to 10,000 for a luxury gold edition. But first, the U.S. Ambassador to South Korea, Mark Lippert, who was hospitalized last Thursday after suffering a knife attack by a South Korean man, will be discharged from hospital very soon. For more, let's go live to our correspondent, Hwang Sung Hee, who's at Seoul's Yonsei Severance Hospital. So, Sung Hee, what can you tell us? Yang Ambassador Lippert will be making his way out here uh, from the hospital in just about 15 minutes' time after giving a short statement to the press. As you can imagine, security here is very tight. You need one of these to get into the press room where uh, the ambassador will be making his speech. This only after you pass a very thorough security check. And now, as you can see, there are police everywhere, both inside and outside the hospital. Uh, it must be noted that this is the very first time uh, for the ambassador to step outside in public uh, since that brutal knife attack uh, last week in central Seoul. The U.S. envoy needed 80 stitches to his right cheek and left arm, but doctors have now removed all the stitches from his face and say he is in a very good condition. However, he is still feeling some pain in his left arm, and doctors will be visiting his home every day to check up on him until he is fully recovered. Now, if this is deemed to be a politically motivated, motivated attack, how likely is it that the U.S. will consider uh, putting North Korea back on its uh, list of state sponsors of terrorism? Well, Hyung Young, that's still too early to tell because an uh, investigation is still underway. But what I can tell you, what I do know for now is that uh, police have found a dozen pro North Korea books at the attacker's home. The 55 year old assailant Kim Gi Jong also reportedly praised late North Korea founder Kim Il sung during uh, his interrogation last weekend, saying there is no leader like him in the South. Now, there is a so called national security law in South Korea which bans people from publicly supporting North Korea. The U.S. State Department said Monday that the question of putting North Korea back on its list of state sponsors of terrorism is going several steps ahead of where things are right now. So it is waiting for the investigation to conclude uh, before it makes any decisions. This has been Hwang sang -hee reporting live from Yansei Severance Hospital. All right, many thanks there, Hwang Sung Hee. That was our uh, Hwang Sung Hee reporting live for us at Seoul Zionze University Severance Hospital. Now, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has urged Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to face its wartime atrocities, saying Germany was able to reconcile with its neighbors after confronting history, quote, openly and squarely. Our Kim ji has the details. German Chancellor Angela Merkel discussed Germany's reconciliatory efforts after World War II on the first day of her two-day visit to Japan. At a joint press conference with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe on Monday, Merkel said Germany's reacceptance by its European neighbors following the war was possible because it had squarely faced its dark past. Merkel said that her country also made sure that the Nazis' horrendous acts would never be overlooked by history, something she regards as a precondition to reconciliation. France, for example, was willing to approach Germany after World War II. The European Union we have today is in fact the product of such a reconciliation process because after centuries of wars, the Europeans said, we want to be united. It is our luck that we are united, which led to a stable peace order.
Her remarks come at a time when Japan has been receiving strong criticism from Korea and China over inadequate acknowledgement of its wartime atrocities. Tokyo faced harsh backlash after it attempted to review past apologies that were made over the forced sexual enslavement of Asian women during World War II, including the landmark 1995 Murayama Statement. Also, Japanese school textbooks have long been accused of whitewashing the country's past aggressions in Asia. Prime Minister Abe is set to issue a statement for the 70th anniversary of Japan's defeat in World War II in August, but there's speculation that it'll try to water down Japan's wartime atrocities. Kim Jong, Arirang News. And upon Markel's visit to Tokyo, a German newspaper slammed Japan for trying to whitewash its past aggressions in Asia. The Daily Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung said Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's attempts to water down Tokyo's past apologies are stifling Japan's economic recovery as they are blocking trade to the world's largest export market, China. It also noted that the Abe administration's behavior serves to bring Korea and China closer together. A top UN official on North Korean human rights has called for more concerted international efforts to raise awareness about Pyongyang's crimes against humanity. He says North Korea's past abduction of foreign nationals should be addressed. Arirang's Connie Kim has more. A senior human rights investigator at the United Nations is calling for concerted international pressure to get North Korea to address its kidnapping of hundreds of foreign nationals. In a report released on Monday, Marzuki Darusman, the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in North Korea, said countries should come together for sustained and resolute action to bring back surviving abductees and shed light on all abduction cases. According to Darusman, North Korean agents have, over the span of more than 50 years, abducted hundreds of foreign nationals from countries such as Japan, South Korea, China, Lebanon and Malaysia. The strategy laid out in the report calls for efforts to refer the North Korean leadership to the International Criminal Court and a global approach to improve North Korea's dire human rights situation. The multi-track approach ultimately aims to bring a close to all enforced disappearances by Pyongyang. North Korea's human rights abuses have come under the spotlight with the UN's publication last year of a landmark report. It outlined North Korea's human rights abuses, including torture, deliberate starvation and execution, leading the approval of a UN General Assembly resolution on the North's human rights abuses. North Korea continues to demand all investigations be scrapped in light of recent events. Speaking in Geneva last week, North Korea's foreign minister, Lee Soo-yong, demanded resolutions based on the report be revoked immediately since the court testimonies were proven to be false after a high-profile defector admitted of falsifying parts of his stories in a political prison camp. Darusman's report will be presented to the Human Rights Council in Geneva next week. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Oh, Choi ryong hae who was widely seen as North Korea's de facto number two, appears to have been demoted. Over the weekend, Pyongyang's official daily, the Rodong Shimun, listed him as an ordinary member of the ruling Workers' Party's Politburo instead of his former title as a standing committee member. Speculation about the change first arose when a state media report last month listed Choi's name after Hwang byung seo the chief of the General Political Bureau of the North Korean Army. North Korea experts suggest the army chief has leapfrogged Che as the regime's second most powerful man. They add North Korean leader Kim Jong-un might be trying to ensure that power is not concentrated on certain figures. Amid speculation that the U.S. might deploy its missile defense system, also known as THAAD, to South Korea to counter threats from North Korea, China is reportedly aiming to block that deployment. The Washington Free Beacon reports that Chinese President Xi Jinping has tried to persuade President Park Geun-hye not to accept Washington's moves. Citing current and former U.S. officials, the report suggests that Beijing will provide more intimate trade and business chances if Seoul knocks the U.S. back. South Korea's defense ministry reaffirmed on Monday that the U.S. has made no request. Seoul says it's working on its own missile defense system that should be ready by 2020. 
Now we are approaching the one-year anniversary since the tragic sinking of the Seolho ferry, which left some 300 people dead. Efforts to honor the victims have continued even beyond Korea, where in the U.S., two heroines were given a special prize for sacrificing their lives to save others. Kwon Soa has this story. It's a medal they will never wear. Two young women who sacrificed their lives to save passengers on the ill-fated Seolo ferry were awarded gold medallions at a chapel in Philadelphia on Sunday for their acts of bravery in last year's disaster. Choi Hye-jung was a teacher at Tanwan High School, which is where the more than 320 students on the ferry were enrolled. They were on a class trip to Jeju Island. Choi is said to have gone down with the ship to save as many people as possible. Park Ji-young was a member of the crew who reportedly saved around 50 passengers before she died, handing them life vests without leaving one for herself. We will think of the prize as an honor given to us by our children and will live our lives in proud service of society. The Fort Chaplin's Memorial Foundation is a nonprofit established by U.S. President Harry Truman in 1951 in remembrance of four chaplains who went down with a torpedoed cruise ship during World War II after saving other passengers and giving up their own life vests. We feel that this act by the two young ladies, Ms. Choi and Ms. Park, is directly related to the sacrifice of the four chaplains. Former U.S. Presidents Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan are also among those who have received the prize for their service to the public. Choi and Park are the first Koreans to be given the award, which now stands as a reminder to people around the world of the sacrifices made on April 16, 2014. Kwon Arirang News. In the year 2012, for Korea, a was added to record high. All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Na Hyung Young, live from Seoul. Shopping market thinks the true meaning of creation shines through. Finance Minister Choi kyung hwan is calling this a New Deal policy for Korea. The government is planning on reviving the economy by inducing tailored investment from the private sector. Arirang's Kim min -ji has the details. Korea's finance minister says he's seeking to spur private investment as part of plans to revitalize the economy saying that the government will seek to implement a Korean version of the New Deal. Minister Che Kyung-hwan announced fresh plans to invigorate infrastructure investment, such as through social overhead capital projects. That includes building government facilities and prisons and revamping schools. Many countries are trying to use New Deals to overcome a recession. We also feel that it is necessary. The New Deal was a program of the administration of U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s to bring economic relief and pull the country out of the Great Depression. Unlike the U.S. program, however, the finance minister made clear that the government will induce investment from the private sector rather than drawing on government funds. The ministry says the government plans to share the risks associated with investment with private companies and it will adopt a profit-sharing structure. However, analysts have questions about the feasibility of the plan. They point out that it will require the strong leadership of the government, strong communication between the government and the public, as well as close coordination of fiscal and monetary policies. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Members of Korea's older generation are becoming more hesitant to spend money these days as they prepare for their lives after retirement. Statistics Korea says the average propensity to consume among households led by people in their 60s tumbled by 11.5 percentage points between 2003 and 2014. The index is the proportion of money people use from their disposable income. In 2003, that age group was spending the most. The second biggest drop was experienced by those in their 50s with a 5.7 percentage point drop. Now, over in Europe, uh, Eurozone finance ministers criticized Greece for wasting time as they raced to unlock additional funding for the troubled country. Shin Semin reports. 
European finance ministers are impatient, saying there is no time to lose. The troubled Greece is quickly running out of funds and must repay its IMF loan installment by the end of the month. Europe's finance ministers has criticized Greece for wasting time. Chairing a meeting with Eurozone finance ministers on Monday, the Dutch finance minister said technical talks on further funding for Greece would start on Wednesday. The Eurogroup chairman says Eurozone member nations are ready to support Greece if it continues on the economic reform path. Uh, the talks have to start rather today than tomorrow uh, and so we shouldn't waste so much time. The extension is only for four months and uh, the time is ticking away. The Eurozone agreed last month to extend Greece's bailout program until June and it is hoping to approve a detailed list of reforms by next month. So far, Athens has only outlined its proposals in broad terms, describing seven reforms it wants to launch. The proposal will be soon discussed with the three institutions dubbed the Troika, the European Commission, the European Central Bank and the IMF. In the meantime, the ECB began its 1 trillion euro quantitative easing program on Monday as Europe's national central banks began picking up the debts of their own governments. The euro fell to its lowest level against the U.S. dollar in 11 and a half years on Monday, ending a $1.08.5, spurring talks of euro dollar parity. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. It was a big day for tech enthusiasts and journalists alike in San Francisco, where as Apple revealed detailed information about its latest wearable gadget, the Apple Watch. Will this launch fire up the sluggish wearables market? That's the big question. Shim young has more. It's been five years since Apple launched the iPad, and now the company is making a major play for the wearables market with this Apple Watch. The watch comes in three different models, the Apple Watch, the Apple Watch Sport, and the high-end Apple Watch Edition. The price ranges from $349 U.S. dollars to $10,000 for a luxury gold edition. The watch has many integrated features such as the Apple Pay mobile wallet, messaging, calls, health tracking applications and the ability to connect your watch to a friend's watch. Pre-orders for the watch start April 10th and it will go on sale on April 24th. It will first be available in the US, Australia, China and Japan, among other countries. The Apple Watch is the most advanced timepiece ever created. Apple enters a market already crowded by major tech companies, ranging from Korea's Samsung and LG to China's Huawei and startups such as Pebble. And with the smartwatch market expected to take off this year with projected sales of 28 million units from last year's 4.6 million, mobile manufacturers are pouring their efforts into making their smartwatches better and more visually appealing. Samsung, which had attempted to steal Apple's thunder with the release of its Galaxy Gear in 2013, is planning to release a new smartwatch during the first half of the year. LG surprised many with its urban smartwatch, which has the ability to make and receive phone calls without the need for a connected smartphone. Apple requires a connection to an iPhone to be fully operational. Kim young Arirang News. Korean classical music, known as Gugak, has a history that dates back over a thousand years, all the way to the Silla Kingdom. The natural sound of Gugak is prized, but there's a secret behind how that sound is achieved. Our Im Yuni is here today to tell us more. Good afternoon, Yuni. Good afternoon. So Gugak has, of course, changed over time, but they've been able to maintain that very beautiful, very unique sound of Gugak uh, by making these specially designed theaters. So I had a look at some of them. Take a look in this next report. Kugak stems from a long, rich history and has maintained Korea's cultural heritage through time. There are various genres of music within Kugak, linked together by the use of traditional Korean instruments. 
There are no microphones on this stage or speakers to project the sounds. Yet every pleck of the kayagum and boom of the pook is crisp and clear to the audience members who are listening. They don't use a mic, but you can still hear the individual sounds of each instrument, which is really special. The set pieces on a kugak stage are typically centered, and there's a traditional folding screen placed center stage to amplify the sounds of the instruments. The material of the folding screen plays a role as well, preventing any unwanted sounds from reaching the audience. Meanwhile, the instruments used in kugak have a significantly shorter reverberation time of only 1.2 seconds at most, as compared to classical instruments with much longer reverberation times. To compensate, the stage is designed and arranged to create the ideal setting for the instruments. With kugak instruments, the reverberations are short, so if it's played in a hall made for long reverberations, the sounds are dulled and jumbled. Instruments with reverberations that are shorter than classical instruments need a different setting for the optimal sound. The National Kugak Center holds regular performances to preserve Korea's traditions and lead the music of kugak into the future. And so apart from the National Kugak Center, where mm -hmm. can people go to catch some of these uh, performances? Well, there are a few options, but the National Kugak Center is probably your best bet, and that's actually right across the street from us. Now, if you go on their website, you can see that they have a monthly calendar where you can see uh, they have performances held pretty much every day. So from Wednesday through Saturday, they have regular performances that range um, from all different types of topics. For instance, on Wednesdays, they hold uh, traditional Korean dance performances, and on Saturdays, they hold special talks about Kugak, led by some of the you know prime Kugak people in our um, country in the field. Mm -hmm. And lately in the sector, it's, the trend has been the fusion of Kugak with other instruments, right? Right, right. So ha there has been this uh, fusion Kugak to say that has been emerging, and that's a very unique approach to Kugak. Uh, now that can include anything from contemporary dance to synthesizers to even pop music included um, into the Kugak performances. Now one example of this is Miso, the musical, uh, which is an open-run musical showing here in Seoul. Uh, now that musical has a traditional folktale storyline, but they do incorporate different Western themes and pop music songs into the performance. So, uh, you know, lots of different twist to Kugak, but nowadays also with YouTube, people are really experimenting with Kugak and you're seeing a lot of fun results. Right. For that uh, musical, you can imagine how much effort will go into really trying to get the audio right. sound level uh, accurate for the mm -hmm. people to audience to really enjoy the, feel, mm -hmm. uh, the musical to the fullest. But right? it's a really fun performance, very successful, something I recommend checking out. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Ayuni, for bringing us this story today. You're very welcome. <laughs> I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. Currently, a cold wave advisory is in effect in most parts of the country, while strong wind alert is in effect on the coastal regions uh, of the peninsula. Now, in fact, a cold wind is blowing nationwide today, which is mainly why we're shivering. Now, the wind is blowing at between 6 and 8 meters per second, bringing down the wind chill to minus 7 degrees. Now, the cold wind is here due to a high pressure front from the northwest and a low pressure front from the east side of the peninsula. And now, aside from that, we'll be mostly under clear sunny skies today. Now, temperatures will go back up starting tomorrow, but they'll still be under seasonal averages. Now, however, later this week, starting on Thursday, we'll see mercury's rise to above the seasonal averages, possibly even into the teens. Now let's have a look at the readings for today. So we'll peak up to 2 this afternoon, while the southern regions such as Gwangju and Busan will get up to 3 and 6 degrees. Moving over to other regions, Jeju Island gets up to 3, Dokdo hits down to negative 2, while Rangkunggang is sunny at negative 9 degrees. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park, and I hope you have a wonderful day. And that's a wrap from us at this hour. I'm Na Hyun Gyung in Seoul. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with more updates at 4 p.m. Korea time.